Chapter 4 The Counterpane Upon waking next morning about daylight, I found Queequeg's arm thrown over me in the most loving and affectionate manner. You had almost thought I had been, I had been his wife. The counterpane was a patchwork, full of odd little party-colored squares and triangles, and this arm of his tattooed all over with an interminable Cretan labyrinth of a figure, no two parts of which were one precise shade. Owing, I suppose, to his keeping his arm at sea all methodically in sun and shade, his shirt sleeves irregularly rolled up at various times, the same arm of his, I say, looked for all the world like a strip of that same patchwork quilt. Indeed, hardly lying on, on it as the arm did when I first awoke, I could hardly tell it from the quilt, they so blended their hues together, and it was only by the sense of weight and pressure that I could tell Queequeg was hugging me. My sensations were strange. Let me try to explain them. When I was a child, I will remember somewhat a similar circumstance that befell me, whether it was a reality or a dream. I never could entirely settle. The circumstance was this. I had been cutting up some caper or other. I think it was trying to crawl up the chimney, as I had seen a little sweep do a few days previous, and my stepmother who, somehow or other, was all the time whipping me or sending me to bed supperless. My mother dragged me by the legs out of the chimney and packed me off to bed, though it was only two o'clock in the afternoon of the 21st June, the longest day in the year of an, in our hemisphere. I felt dreadfully, but there was no help for it. So upstairs I went to my little room in the third floor, undressed myself as slowly as possible so as to kill time, and with a bitter sigh got between the sheets. I lay there dismally calculating the sixteen entire hours must elapse before I could hope for a re resurrection. Sixteen hours in bed. The small of my back ached to think of it. And it was so light too. The sun shining at the window. And a great rattling of coaches in the streets. And the sound of gay voices all over the house. I felt worse and worse. At last I got up, dressed, and softly going down in the, my stocking feet sought out my stepmother, and suddenly threw myself at her feet, beseeching her as a particular favor to give me a good slippering for my misbehavior, anything indeed but condemning me to lie abed such an unendurable length of time. But she was the best and most conscientious of stepmothers, and back I had to go to my room. For several hours I lay there broad awake, feeling a great deal worse than I had ever done since even from the greatest subsequent misfortunes. At last I must have fallen into a troubled nightmare of a doze, and slowly waking from it, half steeped in dreams. I opened my eyes, and the before sunlit room was now wrapped in outer darkness. Instantly I felt a shock running through all my frame. Nothing was to be seen, and nothing was to be heard, but a supernatural hand seemed placed in mine. My arm hung over the counterpane, and the nameless, unimaginable, silent form or phantom to which the hand belonged seemed closely seated by my bedside. For what seemed like ages piled on ages, I lay there, frozen with the most awful fears, not daring to drag away my hand, yet ever thinking that if I could but stir it in one single inch, the horrid spell would be broken. I knew not how this consciousness at last gilded away from me, but waking in the morning, I shudderingly remembered it all, and for days and weeks and months afterwards, I lost myself in confounding attempts to explain the mystery. Nay, to this very hour, I often puzzle myself with it. Now, take away the awful fear, and my sensation at feeling the supernatural hand in mine were very similar, and their strangeness to those which I experienced on waking up and seeing Queequeg's pagan arm thrown around me. But at length all past night's events soberly recurred, one by one, in fixed reality. And then I lay only alive to this comical predicament. For though I tried to move his arm, unlock his bridegroom clasp, yet sleeping as he was, he still hugged me tightly, as though naught but death should part us twain. I now strove to rouse him, quick quick, but his only answer was a snore. I then rolled over, my neck feeling as if it were a horse collar, and suddenly felt a slight scratch. Slowly, or throwing aside the counterpane, there lay the tomahawk sleeping by the savage's side, 
as if it were a hatchet-faced baby. A pretty pickle, truly, thought I. A bed here in a strange house in the broad day, with a cannibal and a tomahawk. Queequeg, in the name of goodness, Queequeg, wake! At length, by dint of much wriggling and loud and incessant expultations upon the becomingness of a hugging, his hugging a fellow male in this matrimonial sort of style, I succeeded in extracting a grunt, and presently he drew his arm and shook, shook himself all over like a Newfoundland dog, just, uh, just from the water, and sat up in bed, stiff as a pike staff, looking at me and rubbing his eyes as he did not altogether remember how I came to be there. To a dim consciousness of knowing something about me, he seemed slowly dawning over him. Meanwhile, I lay quietly eyeing him, having no serious misgivings now, and bent upon narrowly observing so curious a creature. When at last his mind seemed made up touching the character of his bedfellow, and he became, as it were, reconciled to the fact, he jumped upon the floor, and by certain signs and sounds gave me to understand this. If it pleased me, he would dress first, and then leave me to dress afterwards, leaving the whole apartment to myself. Thinks I, Queequeg, under the circumstances, this is very civilized overture. But the truth is, these savages have an innate sense of delicacy. Say what you will. It is marvelous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg, because he treated me with so much civility and consideration. While I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from bed and watching all his toilet motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg you don't see every day. He and his ways were well worth unusual regarding. He commenced dressing at top by donning his beaver hat, a very tall one, by the by, and then, still minus his trousers, he hunted up his boots. Well, what under the heavens he did it for, I cannot tell. But his next movements were to crush himself, boots in hand, and hat on, under the bed, when from sundry violent graspings and strainings, I inferred he was hard at work booting himself, though by no law of propriety that I ever heard of, is any man required to be private when putting on his boots. But Queequeg, do you see, was a creature in the transition stage, neither, ca neither caterpillar nor butterfly. He was just enough civilized to show off his outlandishness in the strangest possible manner. His education was not yet completed. He was an undergraduate. If he had not been a small degree civilized, he very probably would have not troubled himself with boots at all. But then, if he had not been still a savage, he never would have dreamt of getting under the bed to put them on. At last, he emerged with his hat very much dented and crushed down over his eyes, and began creaking and limping about the room, as if not being much accustomed to boots. His pair of dant, wrinkled cowhide ones, probably not made to order either, rather pinched and tormented him at the first go-off of a bitter cold morning. Seeing now, there were no curtains to the window, and the street being very narrow, the house opposite commanded a plain view into the room, and observing more and more the indecorous figure that Queequeg made, staving about with little else but his hat and boots on, I begged him as well as I could to accelerate his toilet somewhat, and particularly to get into his pantaloons as soon as possible. He complied and then proceeded to wash himself. At that time in the morning, any Christian would have washed his face, but Queequeg, to my amazement, contented himself with restricting his ablations to his chest, arms, and hands. He then donned his waistcoat and, taking up a piece of hard soap on the washstand center table, dipped it dipped it into water and commenced lathering his face. I was watching to see where he kept his razor, when lo and behold, he takes the harpoon from the bed corner, slips out the long wooden stock, unsheaths the head, wets it a little on his boot, and striding up to the bit of the mirror against the wall, begins a vigorous scraping, or rather, harpooning of his cheeks. Thinks I Queequeg. This is using Roger's best cutlery with a vengeance. Afterwards, I wondered the less at this operation which I come to know of what fine steel the head of a harpoon is made, and how exceedingly sharp the long straight edge edges are always kept. The rest of his toilet was soon achieved, and he proudly marched out of the room, wrapped up in a great pilot monkey jacket, and sporting his harpoon like a marshal's baton. And that's the end of chapter 4.